So good morning, everybody. Uh, so I'll just repeat uh, Todd's eloquent words. If you are, are participating via telephone, especially if you wouldn't mind uh, putting yourself on mute, we will get to Q and A period after John's prepared remarks, and you'll have uh, opportunity then to ask John a question. But so good morning, everybody. Uh, to those in the room, those participating in Titusville in Florida, in Houston, Texas, and on the telephone. Uh, my name's Damian Mills. I'm the director of communications for uh, Boeing Space and Launch. Uh, thanks for joining, uh, joining us this morning for Boeing's uh, uh, program briefing on the Boeing Starliner program, which will be led by uh, John Mulholland, Vice President and Program Manager for uh, Boeing Commercial Crew Program. For those participating in today's briefing via WebEx or phone, John's speaking to you today from uh, Arlington, Virginia. Uh, of course, we have participants joining us via WebEx at Boeing Titusville and Boeing in Houston, and we have a number of reporters participating <coughs> at various locations from around the country. So before I hand over to John, just let me uh, explain. Can you hear my other is that Again, I just ask if you're on the call, please go on to mute until we get to the Q&A period. Thank you. So before I hand over to John, just let me explain the run for today's uh, briefing. Uh, John will prepare, uh, oh, John has some prepared remarks and we'll share a program <laughs> overview on the Starliner program. Uh, for those of you who are following via telephone, John will be speaking to some charts, however they are quite simple charts, so you should have no issue with following along with the discussion or the, the briefing, even if you don't have visibility of the charts. Be happy to share those charts with everybody after uh, the briefing today. We'll then open up uh, questions from uh, folks here in the room. And Ken, if you can go on mute uh, so we can get through this, I'd appreciate it from folks here in the room, and then we'll take to essentially a question and a follow-up from somebody here in the room, then we'll go uh, facility, Boeing facility to Boeing facility, uh, Titusville first and Texas, and we'll simply follow that rotation of, until we get through the questions here in the room. I, am a, I do have a list of folks joining us by phone, so I will call upon those by name to give you the opportunity for joining us by phone as well. So, so I'll take this. So I'll call. It's always one, isn't it? Yeah. Always one. Oh, it's the New York Times. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so again, <laughs> just to repeat, uh, let's all be on mute until the Q&A period. And with that, I'll hand over to, to John, uh, and we'll get underway here. Thanks, John. Yeah, no, hey, thank you guys very much, and I really do appreciate your interest. I'll, um, I do apologize. I got some prepared remarks, and then I've got a lot of notes, because part of what we're going to do today is go through uh, the OFT data review. So I'll be walking through those and then we'll spend the bulk of the time, obviously, with questions. Uh, in, the, in the spirit of transparency, and as Boeing shares in NASA's goal to launch American astronauts on American rockets from American soil, we're here to talk to you about the status of the Boeing Starliner program. While the IRT has been ongoing and typically there is an information released in that time frame, out of respect for the integrity of the process, we want to continue the discussion with you about what we learned and then our steps forward. We've completed our OFT hardware and data review process and we're incorporating recommendations of the independent review team related to the interim findings you heard about a couple weeks ago. I'm also here to talk about our readiness to receive and implement the final findings of the IRT. I want to add that when we had the orbital insertion anomaly during OFT, we proactively committed to participating in the IRT with NASA. This is something we voluntarily did and I'm proud of the cooperation and openness with which our team has shared information throughout the process. I also want to thank NASA for this IRT process as we've been able to learn much in order to make our processes and our products better. We're grateful to be able to share these outcomes so all of the spaceflight community can learn. And we look forward to learning from others from their IRTs as well. We've always said that we will fly when we're ready and that has been and will be our commitment going forward. We believed it when we were cleared to fly OFT, and we learned some hard lessons that were taken to heart to make an even better spacecraft. Safety in space and mission assurance has always been and will always be this program's top priorities. It's no secret we've had challenges on this complex program, and we've also had some key successes that I'll highlight. We've been doing a lot of learning in the past couple months, which is exactly what we expected to do after a test flight. Much of the learning is on what went right, some of the and some of the details um, of things that we can do better. 
Our enterprise has made a concerted effort to increase the visibility of product safety among our teams and strengthen our engineering processes and organization. We are re recommitting ourselves to the discipline needed to test and qualify our products so that they meet our customers' expectations for safety and quality. The Boeing team is committed to the success of the Starliner program and we're putting in the time and resources to move forward. I also want to address our culture as a program. We have been generationally involved in every domestic human spaceflight program, and this team knows what it takes to get the job done right. I'm sure you can imagine the disappointment with what occurred during the OFT mission. We have an excellent team, and every one of them has put their heart and soul into making this program a success. That was evident during the 48-hour flight. They rallied together and brought the Starliner home safely for a historic land landing. We know that we need to improve, particularly in rebuilding trust with our customer, and we pledge our discipline and commitment to doing so. We're going to apply additional rigor to systems engineering and software development, and I'll talk about that shortly. And I think we can go to the pitch now, if, if you're ready. Sure. And we can go ahead to the next page. So we'll, we'll break this down um, into just, just three different slides. Um, First, I'd like to talk about the hardware inspection and the path forward in the factory as we continue to move forward. Um, spacecraft 3, which was the OFT spacecraft crew module, um, has, we've completed the hardware inspection on that. We did a thorough interior and exterior inspection uh, of all of the hardware systems. Uh, we looked at the parachutes after landing, thermal protection, the airbags, the NASA docking system, and then throughout the crew module, we um, took off closeout panels and did uh, interior inspections. And, and by and large, the vehicle hardware uh, was in outstanding shape uh, after landing. And we'll go through a little bit more of that. Uh, and, and I'll go through the data review also. But uh, with the completion uh, of the hardware and data review, we have cleared the uh, Spacecraft 3, the OFT crew module, for continued processing in the factory. Spacecraft 2, uh, which will be the uh, spacecraft for the next flight, uh, is in the middle of, of uh, build up to, um, to support that, uh, the next flight. Right now, that crew module is in what we call the hazardous uh, production area. That is where we're doing the, uh, the proof and leak test of all the spacecraft fluid systems. So a, a key milestone as we continue to progress that build and get ready for flight. Going on to the next chart. You know, three, three key areas, uh, and I'll walk through a mission data summary uh, that we saw on the orbital flight test, but broken down into, into the three key areas. And, and all of those, uh, there were certain focus areas that we had, and I'll kind of walk through um, uh, the performance of each of those systems and some of the surprises. We had a lot of surprises where the systems actually performed better than we predicted. Uh, and then, as you know, we had a few areas where, um, where we've got a little bit of work to do, and I'll kind of walk through that. So starting with the launch phase, uh, and obviously a key focus area, it's one of the, one of the primary areas of, of risk in human spaceflight, and I'd like to report that the launch vehicle just performed flawlessly. So the integrated system, when we were attached to the launch vehicle, um, was just uh, absolutely spot on. Uh, the launch vehicle dropped us off on target. All of the separation systems from the spacecraft, uh, spacecraft to launch vehicle uh, performed nominally, um, and there was no... Uh, no issues with any of the launch. Obviously, um, as we separated from the launch vehicle, uh, we had our mission elapsed timing anomaly, and we'll talk about that on the next chart. But moving on to uh, on to the on-orbit phase, and and this is you know the key area uh, that we look at on orbit is can we can we maintain uh, a healthy cabin environment to support the spacecraft and the crew? That's obviously the focus for on-orbit. And, and largely, uh, all the systems perform fantastic. And I'll just kind of walk through a, first, a few of them. The first, and, and obviously one of the real key areas, in, is environmental control and life support. Uh, the performance across all of those systems were at or better than pre-test predicts. So they all perform flawlessly. Uh, one of the areas that, uh, that we use to reject heat uh, in certain phases of flight is called our sublimator. Uh, so that provides cooling for the spacecraft systems uh, on ascent before you get on orbit and the radiators are effective. And then we use a sublimator system uh, on re-entry after we separate from the service module uh, because the radiators uh, 
go away with the service module. Uh, conservatively, we set the start time of that sublimator uh, a little lower, um, and that was because we had pretest predictions that we might need that cooling earlier. We had a little what we call breakthrough on that sublimator at the very beginning. And what that means, uh, the way a sublimator works is, is you put water into the system into some plates with very small holes. They freeze up. Uh, and then because it's exposed to, to the vacuum of space, it sublimates, provides that heat rejection that we use for cooling. Uh, because we started it uh, a little earlier than, um, uh, than nominal um, as a conservative measure, at the very beginning we had a little water flow through. You didn't get that sublimator heating. Um, and so operationally going forward, we'll just start that sublimator uh, about a minute later uh, because it performed flawlessly after we got to the right um, altitude. On the power systems, power systems um, were actually about 25% better than predict. The power systems worked flawlessly and provided uh, more power. The solar arrays did great, provided more power than we expected. That, that's really an important point for us, uh, is legacy human spaceflight programs, including the space shuttle. As we got on orbit uh, into non-critical phases of the mission, we actually power down different avionics boxes to save power. Uh, we'll be able to rethink that now after this test flight because we produce more power than we needed and we might leave those, those avionics systems uh, online and provide more robustness. Uh, VESTA and, and the NASA docking system. So VESTA is our system that provides us the visual cues for autonomous rendezvous and docking uh, and the NASA docking system. Uh, because we didn't dock, uh, we didn't get the full check out of those systems as we had planned. Uh, but we got a lot of good data. On the VESTA in particular, one of the key um, functions of VESTA, besides the autonomous rendezvous and docking, is, is to provide our star tracking. We use star trackers uh, embedded in the VESTA system uh, to provide us inertial nav updates that we need during the mission. And the star tracker function performed excellent, uh, which is really good news. We also got a lot of um, video from the VESTA uh, to prove that that system was working right. And even though we didn't dock on the NASA docking system uh, while we were on orbit, uh, we did check the functionality of the NASA docking system. We extended the rings, and so we, we know we have good command and control of the NASA docking system. Uh, we did have a number of floaters uh, that we saw on orbit. Uh, these are things that exposed themselves in, in zero G. Uh, they were very benign and didn't, didn't uh, pose any threat. And, and we're actually on the low side of, of typical human spaceflight programs. You know, that said, going forward, uh, we always want to, to get to zero on those kind of items, and so it'll help us as we learn uh, to make sure we um, don't see those in the future. You know, one of the areas, the other areas we look at is, did we see any single event upsets? So we, uh, in the environmental qualification test, uh, program that we ran out in El Segundo, that was one of the, the three main areas of that test program to subject it to environmental um, radiation, and we didn't see any uh, single event upsets on orbit, so that was really good news and validated the test that we saw in environmental testing. Uh, on orbit, the, the thrusters on the service module uh, proved themselves to be extremely robust. As you remember, um, we did see a very high duty cycle, a uh, higher duty cycle than planned of those thrusters uh, early on uh, w when we didn't establish the forward link. Uh, that very high duty cycle rate caused uh, the transducer element uh, within the pressure transducer of the a number of the thrusters um, to offset, to get offset and, and read sometimes off scale high or off scale low. We went through a methodical process of checking out those thrusters uh, and then uh, turning off the fault detection on those systems, rechecked all of the thrusters, and all but one of those thrusters performed flawlessly throughout the mission. So the thrusters uh, performance was, was extremely good and showed more robustness than, uh, than planned. One of the er other areas that um, uh, we looked at was the, the heater system. So we have resistance heaters uh, on a lot of the, the CM propulsion system. It's broken down into six zones. In one of those six zones, uh, we saw that we weren't getting, uh, we weren't maintaining um, the target temperature uh, in that specific zone unless we turned on both of the strings of heaters. So we do have uh, heater redundancy. Um, Typically, you don't like to use that redundancy to maintain nominal temperature. You, you save it for, uh, for a fault condition. 
Uh, and so we're looking at that one zone of that CM prop system to see whether we need to add more insulation or add a little bit more, uh, another string of, uh, of heaters. So that was, that was a finding, but uh, didn't, didn't pose an issue on the flight and is easily corrected. You know, moving on to, uh, to re-entry. So obviously um, uh, another key phase of the flight to make sure you can safely re-enter. It's, it's the, probably the second most uh, hazardous area in human space flight. And, and the re-entry and landing was, um, was very nominal. So from a guidance, navigation, and control standpoint, um, it, it performed outstanding. Uh, our landing was within a couple of football fields of target, and, which was just really phenomenal from a landing standpoint. Our parachutes performed nominal, obviously a key area for us. We uh, did the parachute inspection after landing. We didn't see any degradation in the chutes. We had nominal chute performance. Uh, the landing loads were also benign, obviously a key factor for us as, as we uh, progress uh, into uh, the end state of crew service missions. Our landing loads were, were below predict and, and actually three times lower than, um, than requirements. So landing loads were very benign. All the separation planes uh, were nominal. So obviously we look at all the pyrotechnic separation, so crew module to service module. Uh, that separation was nominal. Um, obviously we had the, uh, the on-orbit discovery of the, um, the jet mapping issue for the separation and disposal burn. I'll talk a little bit more about that on the next flight. Um, but um, the fix uh, proved adequate on that, and, and everything was nominal on reentry and landing. Thermal protection, uh, another key area for us uh, to get our hands on the hardware after we landed. Um, the base heat shield was one of the real key areas that we wanted to look at. Um, because of the size of the base heat shield and the importance of it to, uh, to reject the, uh, the re-entry uh, thermal environment, um, we wanted to, to get a close look at that, and it actually performed significantly better than, uh, than predicted, um, which was really good. Um, Let's see, the other, another item to note um, are, are SIGIs. So that's our inertial nav boxes. One of the three SIGIs, um, after we got through the plasma region, um, didn't, get the, um, uh, didn't get updated um, in the time frame that were required. And so one of the SIGIs we didn't incorporate into the nav state. So we, we came down with two. That's not a problem. Uh, you have dual redundancy on the SIGIs. And so we're off uh, looking at, at that SIGI and the filtration and, and seeing if we need to make any minor corrections. Um, you know, besides, besides all of the hardware, uh, you know, one of the key things that, that we look at and evaluate is team performance. So three phases of the team, uh, the launch team, um, the mission control team, and, and then the landing and recovery team. And all of those teams uh, performed flawlessly during the mission. I couldn't have been prouder of the, the team during and after the flight. And the last thing I'll point out is the, is the CM or service or the crew module propulsion system. So we use the crew module propulsion system to maintain attitude during reentry after we separate from the service module. All of the thrusters performed excellently. Uh, we did see uh, one valve that failed to close uh, that is a pressurization valve um, that provides uh, the muscle pressure uh, to feed the, uh, the propellant system. So it's a nitrogen valve. Um, and it didn't close on re-entry, so we will uh, take that valve out uh, uh, in the next couple of weeks and we'll get our eyes on that and, and uh, make sure we understand uh, what caused that valve not to close. Oh, and with that summary, that, that concludes um, uh, our effort on both the hardware and, and the data review uh, that we had on the orbital flight test mission, which um, largely was very successful. And I'll move into uh, to our path forward um, on the next slide, you know, we did have, uh, as you know, the two software areas, and, and we went through that in the last press conference, so I'll just hit those um, very lightly and then move through uh, what we're doing from a forward path standpoint. Uh, you remember on Ascent, the MET problem uh, where we failed to pull the, the correct time from the, from the launch vehicle? And then, as I mentioned earlier on the SM disposal, the jet mapping issue that, uh, that we had to correct on orbit and uh, got that successfully resolved. I will tell you on, on all of those issues, on those two software issues, uh, the interim report that we got from the, uh, from the IRT was extremely helpful and has allowed our team to move out and we're making excellent progress as we, as we strengthen um, 
the robustness there. Uh, one of the key steps uh, that we needed to to improve um, on the team is, is our systems engineering and process discipline. The team's uh, already got plans to go implement those and, and we're moving out. Uh, one of the, the key areas of progress that uh, um, that we've been able to make with some of the interim findings um, and, and one of the action items that, that we took in the IRT um, also noted was the need to go back and look at the software, um, specifically the, the testing that was done in the formal qualification test. And so we have already completed the audit of all the high, medium, and most of the low complexity, logic complexity items in the software system where we compare the software requirements to the testing uh, that was performed uh, in FQT to identify any gaps. We have noticed uh, a few of the gaps. Those don't correspond to software errors. Those are just areas where we didn't fully test all of the logic paths. And so the team's moving out, um, evaluating those gaps, doing some additional testing uh, to determine whether we have uh, potentially any other code anomalies that, uh, that we need to fix. Uh, they haven't found any yet, but we'll, we'll move through that process to make sure we do have that full audit of all of our software systems. So a number of actions that, uh, that are still in work, and we're still in the formulation phase, but the team's aggressively moving out. Now, I would want to point out that we are grateful, and I did mention our, um, um, this earlier on, but uh, having the join IRT provided a tremendous amount of value. The other thing that we're doing uh, besides looking internally is we're taking the opportunity of this IRT and the findings of it to brief other, brief other programs both inside and outside Boeing as part of our commitment to make human spaceflight and other spaceflight safer and keep other programs from uh, hopefully making similar mistakes. So we're committed to doing that and we've already started. I will note that the IRT is still working on the communication system issue. That was the issue where we uh, uh, we're delayed in, in, in getting the forward link established. Uh, we saw that 37 times during the mission, 36 of them, uh, all over one specific geographic footprint. Uh, the other time we, we didn't see forward lock is, is well understood, and that was what we call a false, false lock um, uh, of the antennas, where they falsely believe that they are connected to the TDRS, but they aren't. Uh, so we're looking uh, with the IRT across multiple areas, uh, making sure that uh, we fully understand uh, the environment and, and that our system going forward will be robust to all of the environments that we might see. Uh, we're looking at antenna selection and some of the algorithms. For the false lock system, we can put in, it's pretty easy to put in uh, code that uh, detects and, and will reset if you get a false lock. Uh, but right now with the IRT, uh, we've actually wanted to keep them moving on a little, a little longer uh, to participate with us on all of the analysis and testing we're doing. So instead of just giving us actions to go do the analysis and tests, they're partnering with us through the process to make sure that they're comfortable with all the analysis and tests. And, um, and we expect to have uh, the IRT outbrief on, um, on the communication system uh, later in the month of March. We'll say that these improvements are, are going to help um, an already very talented um, Starliner team. Um, this team has proved itself uh, with their thoroughness. The majority of, of all of the software uh, worked very well uh, during the flight, and it's a testament um, to that team. We had these two issues, um, but the path that we're on will allow us to not only fix those, but provide ad additional robustness uh, in our systems and our teams moving forward. Um, and the other thing that, uh, that we're doing uh, to make sure that we're, we're taking this learning uh, beyond just the Boeing team, uh, we're partnering with all of our supply partners uh, to make sure that we maintain the highest level of product and integrity throughout the supply chain. Uh, and to support that, we, we've stepped up and, and we've already gone out and witnessed 61 build events. Um, as they're building, as the supply chain is building up hardware, uh, to make sure that we have process discipline through the entire entire chain, and we've got 160 more of those events scheduled uh, over the balance of the year. So we're trying to take this um, this improvement focus that we have not only in the Boeing team but the supply chain, and then also taking the opportunity to brief you know other Boeing and NASA programs to make sure that that learning spreads uh, beyond our team. 
and that's my uh, those remarks. And I'll turn it over to Danem to uh, to let you guys ask any questions. Thank you, John. Uh, so I'll ask for the other locations to please remain on, on uh, mute. We will come around to you and to you on the phone. But uh, let's open the first question to hear on the floor. Go for it, Chris. Sure. Uh, if, you, sorry, if I wouldn't. Sorry to step on you there, Chris. If I wouldn't, if you wouldn't mind, just when you do have a question, if you wouldn't mind just uh, sharing your name and your uh, affiliation. Uh, but go ahead, please, Chris. It's uh, Chris Davenport with the Washington Post. Um, sort of a two-part question on the software development, John. I wonder if you. Can give us a sense of if you used uh, sort of an agile development process or a, a more of like a waterfall process. And then in terms of that, as you're testing and verifying it, I wonder if you could walk us through, there was some talk of using like emulation, but I'm sort of curious how much of the testing was done on equipment components that were, you know, true flight fidelity and what relationship, you know, that testing and verification process had to NASA's conclusion, at least interim conclusion, that you know some of these errors were quote unquote detectable. I'm just sort of wondering why they weren't detected in the testing and verification. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So we use a, a more standard software development process, um, and and it's designed uh, with multiple checks along the way. So the first thing is is the development of the software requirements. Uh, then you move into to code development to implement those requirements into code. Go through a process of peer review, and then we call unit testing. So on a small scale, you're just testing um, that specific piece of code back to the requirement. That's step one. Uh, then you move into integrated testing. Uh, we'll run through a, a number of integrated runs in the lab before you get into the formal qualification testing. So multi-step process designed to, to ferret out um, any code issues. So I'll specifically, and, and within the lab itself, the majority of the hardware um, is, is flight hardware, but yes, we do um, in some cases use emulators when, when some of that hardware uh, was being used for other purposes or, or was not available for one reason or another. And, and I'll get to the, um, uh, to specifically speak to that, I'll go to the, um, the issue that we uncovered in flight on the uh, service module separation and disposal. Uh, so we did, uh, in, in the case of that one, uh, and, and you'll remember that it was a jet mapping issue, because we were using a legacy propulsion controller, um, it, we actually had a different jet map um, for the um, on-orbit portion when we're mated with the spacecraft. Uh, then the jet map that is used after the service module separates and it has to use uh, its own, uh, the propulsion controller then controls that through the separation and disposal because the, the uh, flight computers on the crew module can't command it. Uh, unfortunately, um, that requirement was not put, picked up. Uh, it, was, it was in what we call the ICD or the interface control document between the propulsion controller and the spacecraft. Um, the only thing that was picked up um, was the one jet map for the integrated spacecraft and, and we missed the jet map that was required for the service module after separation. Uh, unfortunately when we went and, and did that test in the lab, previously we had had um, that propulsion controller in the lab. Um, but during uh, the service module hot fire test that we did, that uh, piece of hardware was required to go perform that service module hot fire test. And, and so while that propulsion controller was outside uh, supporting that other test was when they ran the, um, the, the qualification test of that section of the software. And because we had an incorrect emulator, it didn't have the correct jet, jet mapping, um, that issue was not uncovered during that qualification test. Um, because that hardware was, was returned to the lab, uh, we were able to, during the mission, rerun that sequence, identify the jet mapping issue, get that corrected, and, and upload the software fix before we did the reentry burn. Uh, so it didn't create an issue for us, but particularly in that, one of the, um, uh, the process discipline steps that we are implementing, and we're implementing many, um, we're not only going to define exactly what tests have to be performed, but we're going to require um, 
that we define exactly what the hardware configuration needs to be in the lab. So if, if it is important to have a specific piece of avionics in the lab, we're, we'll be required to have that in there before we actually run that qual test. Uh, so yes, we part of the, the audit that we're doing um, is not only did the requirements get coded right and tested right, uh, we're going through all of the scripts, all of the emulators that we use in the lab and, and re-verifying the fidelity of those. That's one of the, uh, the audit traces that we're doing. Um, the second, or, you know, the first issue that we had, but the other issue that we had on the MET, on the MET EPIC, uh, we do a lot of uh, integrated testing. We did a lot of integrated testing um, with the launch vehicle. Uh, in, in two different phases, actually, we took um, our avionics boxes that we have in our lab in Houston and, and we sent them out to Denver where we integrated them in the Denver SIL, or Systems Integration Lab, and, and we ran a number of ASEM profiles uh, in the Denver lab. We also took um, the ULA system, which is called a kite, which emulates the, the launch vehicle. We brought that kite system down and integrated it into our lab in Houston and ran a number of other runs. Um, and the issue that we uncovered there, the focus uh, of the team from a qualification standpoint was the mated phase, so when we were actually mated to the launch vehicle. And so we ran a number of runs to make sure that the spacecraft and the launch vehicle uh, were correctly communicating with each other and there were no issues. Unfortunately, um, the run was stopped after we separated from the launch vehicle. The team proved that the integrated phase was correct uh, through a number of runs. Unfortunately, because we incorrectly pulled the MET time from the launch vehicle, and then we concluded the run after launch vehicle separation, um, that that issue wasn't uh, uncovered in the, in the laboratory testing. Uh, and so going forward, one of the requirements that we'll institute is we are going to run uh, the full launch to docking scenario. So we run all the way through launch to docking. Uh, and then we'll have another run, um, obviously, where we run uh, from undocking to landing. So we'll broaden the time frame um, of each of those qualification test runs so we get the full gamut of the operation and, and are not breaking it up into logical chunks. Thanks, Sean. Uh, let's uh, change gears here. So well, let's head down to uh, Titusville, uh, Boeing Space and Launch Headquarters in Titusville. Rebecca, is there anybody in the room who's got a question for John? Um, almost everyone in the room. <laughs> so we'll go with Marsha Dunn, AP first. Um, hello, Marsha Dunn, Associated Press. Um, how, how long do you think all this code testing, million lines of code, how long is that going to take? And um, what's your best guess on when next test flight might be, with or without a crew? I, I don't want to avoid that question, but I don't want to give you uh, an answer that, um, that we're really not ready to give you. One of the key, one of the key areas um, and one of the real benefits that, that we got with the interim IRT findings is, is to be able to get the, um, all of those action items and now go turn those into, um, into, into tasks that we can resource and go perform. Like I said, we've already moved out on a number of them. Uh, we've partnered all the priority one um, action items with the IRT. Um, we've presented all of the priority two action items to the IRT. They've given us their comments. We'll have those partnered with them uh, by early next week. And, and that will really help us because now we've got defined actions that we can go understand and work with the team to determine how long how long it's going to take. Uh, but the time frame uh, between now and the next flight is, is really going to be determined, be determined by us working our way methodically through that audit process. Uh, we'll see if we uncover any other code corrections that we need to go make and then work through the testing uh, coming out of it. So uh, unfortunately, I think it's, it's a little too early. We haven't um, gotten all of those action items uh, appropriately scheduled yet. Uh, that should happen uh, within the next couple weeks and, and that will uh, allow us to provide a much firmer time on when we think we'll get through the audit phase. Um, and then of course, uh, once you get through that, um, uh, depending on what you find, it, it might be a, a short amount of time, it might be a little longer amount of time to implement all of the fixes that we need to go implement. So it's, it's really hard right now to give you an exact time frame. Um, 
Yeah, hi, Bill Hart with uh, CBS News with two for me. You mentioned uh, those 36 com dropouts or problems you had. You mentioned them over a specific area. I'm just wondering what area that was over. Uh, and two, just to follow up on Marshall a little bit, I understand you, know, you can't tell us when you might want to end or which flight that might be. But can ULA accommodate um, a flight in this calendar year, whether it's another OFT or a food flight? Um, in other words, if the hardware supports to launch a flight this calendar year, I guess that's my question. Thanks. And two of them. Um, so b back on the first one, that, uh, that geographical area was largely northern Europe over into Russia and what um, what what the IRT is is focused on now um, on that evaluation it's a, multiple steps as I mentioned but one of the, one of the areas that we're looking at is is antenna selection so I don't know if it was um, exactly associated with with that area or not but one of the things that we're looking at is is the antenna selection and and maybe optimizing that going forward it's just, if you picture your spacecraft in the Earth, if you're if you're trying to point to a satellite that has you, this isn't the right technical term, but skipping over the lower atmosphere, uh, it would be much easier for you to pick up any interference that we had um, in that area. And so, um, what we I don't I don't want to say that that specific area. Um, what the, the problem was produced specifically because of the area we were flying over or or because we were we were trying to point to satellites that uh, that maybe the just normal ground interference would have caused us an issue um, and so we really need to look a little bit deeper into that before we uh, give any final results um, and then I'm sorry your second question was about uh, uh, the launch manifest yes um, ULA um, does have us uh, on the manifest this year and so they they can support um, us um, pending uh, spacecraft readiness. Thanks, John. Thanks, Bill. Uh, Steve in Texas, is there anybody in the room there that's got a question for John? Yes, we're going to go first with Eric Berger from Ars. Yeah, hi, Eric Berger, Ars Technica. Thank, thanks for doing this. Uh, two, two questions for me, uh, John. Uh, first of all, on the, the comms issue you talked about, like if you had an astronaut, in the spacecraft, what would that mean? Would that mean like a five second delay in trying to communicate with the ground? Would that mean like a blackout? Um, and like how frequent would that have been, you know, during the mission? Um, that's my first question. And then the second one is just kind of a clarification. About a week ago, there was a report, I think, in TASS about Starliner's landing system, part of that being made in Voronezh in Russia. Is the is part of the Starliner landing system supplied from a supplier in, uh, in Russia? Sure. Back back to the first one. The um, uh, the 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 thirty seven issues, the thirty six issues that we saw. You know, un unfortunately, um, as you know, we got caught by timing, and and so the um, the uh, the delay in the forward link when we tried to get into the first uh, orbital insertion burn was delayed, and so we missed that. Um, those those usually were were pretty small in the order of single digit number of minutes. In some cases, we lost the forward and return link. In some cases, it was just the forward link. Um, you know, e even under um, even under a normal flight of Starliner of the space shuttle program, you always end up in in, in periods on each orbit of, of loss of signal. That's you know, typically about 10 minutes. It can be a little longer, um, can be a little shorter. So, loss of signal is something that the uh, the astronauts are. Are, are accustomed to, trained for, uh, and they're they're trained to operate the spacecraft. Um, even if um, we we did lose communication for a longer period of time, so with crew on board, that uh, certainly would not have been an issue. Um, and the the second one, um, on, yeah, we do have uh, one Russian avionics box. It's the um, it it actually. Um, is, is a, a legacy system that uh, is already flying on the International Space Station. That, that box converts the power uh, from the Russian segment to the, uh, to the U.S. segment. Um, you know, one of the, the key focuses that we had as we did the early design uh, of Starliner was to pull in where appropriate legacy hardware. It, it lowers the development risk, uh, increases mission assurance when you can, when you can bring in 
uh, already flight proven boxes. We did that on the, uh, the flight computers. Uh, but this power converter box uh, was supplied to us um, uh, by uh, a company in Russia, Orbita, if I believe. Um, but it's, it's not on the landing system. It actually does power conversion for us when we're docked to the International Space Station. Thanks, Sean. Let's uh, switch back to the room here. Uh, go for it. Jillian? Yeah. Hi, I'm Jillian Rich with Investors Business Daily. I have two questions. Um, reports have come out saying that Boeing decided not to do an end-to-end -end integrated test. Why was this decided? And then you can follow up on the Russian boxing. I thought we were trying to get away from using you know, Russian products. Like, Is there any way that you see that shifting to a U.S. supplier in the future? Um. Okay, so the, the first one on, on the end-to-end -end testing, um, I, I, I kind of went through that earlier, but um, you know, I, I don't think that report was characterized exactly right. Um, we did an extensive amount of testing in the laboratory. So the one, one in particular that, that you're referring to there was the integrated testing that we had with the launch vehicle. Um, you know, we, we did extensive amount of, of testing integrated with the launch vehicle, both in, in the laboratory or in the, the lab in, in Denver and also in the lab of, of Houston. The, um, the one improvement that we're going to make going forward is to make sure that um, before each flight we will run the, the launch to docking uh, phase of the mission and then we'll run the docking to uh, undocking to landing phase of the mission complete and not separated into chunks. You know, and unfortunately, um, the, uh, the MET EPIC exposed itself to us um, because we, we cut off the run uh, integrated with, this, with the launch vehicle after launch vehicle separation instead of continuing it. So um, there, there, is, there is obviously an um, improvement that we need to go make, and we're going to go do that. Uh, but certainly I wouldn't characterize it that the team did not do extensive testing because they did. Um, and then... On the second part, you know, it's you know, we we want to make sure we we certainly uh, could if um, if we needed to move uh, to a different solution on the power converter boxes we can do that internally we can use suppliers the the decision was made um, in in coordination uh, with NASA as we as we implemented that that box design. Uh, because it was an already qualified system, already being used on the International Space Station for the last 20 years, we had a lot of confidence in that box um, and, and its capability. Um, you know, as, we, as we continue to move forward and support um, the International Space Station, we're going to continue to have partnerships and, and fly uh, Americans on, on Russian vehicles and fly Russians on American vehicles. Um, and so we have a, a strong partnership with the International Space Station um, going forward. And so we had no reservations about that. But obviously, if, if the situation arose, we could, uh, we could bring that back and, and manufacture that in-house. Thank you. So we took a couple in Florida. Let's take two from the room here. Okay. Go ahead, Marsha. Uh, Marsha Smith, SpacePolicyOnline.com. Mm -hmm. Could you talk more broadly about the contractual relationship between Boeing and NASA on this and who makes which decisions, so, and who has to pay for this? I know that Boeing took our $410 million charge in case you have to fly mm -hmm. again. So does NASA have the authority within your contract to tell you that you must fly a second flight? And who decides about the software testing? Is, all, is Boeing making all those decisions? Or can NASA come in and say, no, 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 you need to do a different kind of a software test? And to put it in an even broader context, as NASA moves forward with these kinds of public-private partnerships, perhaps even on a human landing system, do you see changes in the kind of contractual arrangements you need to have with the government in these types of programs? Certainly. So, multi-part question. So, the you know one of the things that um, I think sometimes. Uh, people might focus too much on is is the specific contract type you know this is unique to human spaceflight it's the first time we've ended up uh, had a fixed price development program on a human spaceflight mission in the past they've all been cost plus I would say um, from a Boeing standpoint the approach that we take uh, on on uh, any human spaceflight program 
there's no difference um, in our approach because it's fixed price versus the traditional cost plus. Uh, we have uh, we have embedded uh, the NASA team with us. They they come to all of our engineering boards, um, and so we we partner with them um, in a way that's very consistent with what we've done on on historical human spaceflight programs. They obviously were. Um, embedded with us in, in the decisions that we made on, on our software verification process. So we try and be very open and inclusive uh, with our customer. I think that has uh, served us very well. Um, it, it's obvious that, um, that the NASA as a customer is, is looking at uh, different uh, contracting mechanisms as, as they look towards exploration in the gateway. Um, those, those are something that uh, uh, you know, you have to look at at um, at the at the risk balance from a, from a NASA standpoint and a um, and a supplier standpoint, uh, and those really uh, it's important to tailor those contract types to the specific mission that you're performing. Um, I applaud NASA for the um, the implementation uh, of the commercial crew program. One of the uh, one of the key factors that um, is really help enabling. Um, the emergence of the commercial human spaceflight market is the contract mechanism that they used for commercial crew. It allows us to maintain design ownership and, and thus ease the, um, the emergence into commercial sales beyond, beyond NASA missions. So a lot of uh, forethought went into that and I think that's going to be very beneficial as, as we move forward. Um, the other part of your question, help remind me. Whether or not you see any changes that need to be made in future contracts as you move forward in this kind of new arrangement where you don't have a cost plus contract and a cost per call in the company, do you think the model that you have with commercial crew is applicable to future? You know, yeah. and, and for an example, this was a joint IRT, mm -hmm. so Boeing agreed to have an IRT with NASA, mm -hmm. but do you feel that the government should be able to require a company to have an IRT because there have been other incidences with other companies where IRTs are not required. So I'm, I'm just trying to get a feel for how the business relationship is going on this versus your more traditional cost plus contracts that you've had in the past. Um, I, can, I can only speak for Boeing. Um, you know, on, on launch day, um, we specifically asked NASA to partner with us on an IRT. Uh, and so that's the way we approach it. I, I, I don't know how others may or may not approach it. Um, I, I think as you look at contract types moving forward, um, a lot of that, it, it, it again gets into the, the balance of risk. Um, and there needs to be appropriate risk acceptance on both the government side and the, and the contractor side. A lot of it, um, you know, my belief is, is based on uh, the ability to adequately define all the requirements you need. You know, so for complex, maybe deep space missions where the requirements might not be as, as solid as low Earth orbit, uh, you know, there, there might be different contracting mechanisms for, for the low Earth orbit and, and, our, and the commercial crew mission. Uh, you know, we, we believe it's appropriate and, um, and, and, and actually will help us as we try and, and emerge that uh, commercial spaceflight market. Uh, the other question, I'm sorry, I forgot. The other part of your question was um, uh, the decision process for flying uh, an uncrewed versus a crewed flight. And you know, even from our CEO came out and said, you know, that is um, a NASA decision to make. And so NASA's uh, doing the evaluation of that now. And, and you know, it's their decision on, on which flight would be next. Thanks, John. Thanks much. Let's go to Florida. Uh, Rebecca, uh, somebody in the room ha there have a question for John. Hi, John. Thanks for doing this. This is Chabella Carrizano with the Orlando Sentinel. Uh, it seems that the emulator issue was uh, part of the problem with the software testing. Uh, was there no requirement? So this is sort of a three-part question, but it's on the same thing. Was there no requirement to do at least one whole test without using emulators? And um, do you think you would have caught the issues that later happened in the flight if you had not used emulators for some of that testing? And is there moving forward, are you going to do any, are you going to be required to do a full test without using the emulator uh, prior to the next mission? Thanks a lot. Sure. Um, so a couple things, and, I'll, and let me parse it out a little bit. Um, so certainly on the, um, 
on the issue with the uh, jet mapping on the uh, service module separation and disposal. Um, that, that emerged because um, the emulator was not correct because the jet mapping, um, the two different jet maps that we needed uh, from an integrated spacecraft versus the service module standalone. Um, we, you know, we are not going to, we don't, we're not waiting to be told um, how we're going to, to deal with that going forward. We have moved out and, and, and I'll just kind of walk through every step of the process, you know, because I, I kind of walk through the, the requirements to code, to peer review, unit test, integrated test, and, and, and FQT. Across every step of the way, we're adding um, increased discipline and requirements for um, the review uh, and approval process for uh, the peer reviews, the unit testing, integrated testing, and FQT, down to the level of uh, trying to drive system engineering improvements across the team. Not only exactly what tests that we're going to perform, uh, who needs to review and approve them, and the specific hardware configuration in the lab that's required to support that test. So we're we're driving that process discipline in across the entire team and across the entire flow to, to make sure those uh, issues don't emerge themselves in, in future flights. Um, now, I, I will say that um, in human spaceflight, it's not atypical to have emulators because you, you don't always you, you need emulators for some cases in the labs. One of the other things that uh, that we are doing. Um, not only doing the audit of the code, but we're doing audits of all the scripts and all the emulators to make sure, you know, when we use emulators, because they can be very useful in some cases, but you want to be certain that the emulator uh, accurately reflects the operation of the flight hardware that you would have in there. Thank you, John. Uh, let's go to Steve in Texas. I, I know there's plenty of questions here, so uh, we'll try and get around to everybody. Steve? This is uh, Andrea from uh, Houston Chronicle. Hi, I'm just looking for a clarification on the audit that's going on. Um, so are you saying that Boeing has checked most or all of your one million lines of code and you've not found anything? Or can you walk through that again, like if you've completed that audit, if it's still in process, and what those gaps were that you saw? Thank you. No, absolutely. So we, we haven't um, gotten into the phase yet where we have uh, validated or exposed the remainder of the code. Uh, first step of that process was to go from requirements to test and, and identify whether there was any gaps um, in the FQT testing of any of the logic strings. So um, when you get um, into medium or high complexity logic strings, for instance, if you have an if-then-else statement in the logic or, uh, or a condition, if you have condition A and B, or condition C, then do D. So you, you, you do get into some complexity in the logic strings on, on how the software will react. Um, ideally, and going forward, we would test every one of those logic strings. Um, in, in, the, in the qualification test that was done previously, they tested in those cases, in some cases, some of those logic strings, not every one. So the audit was went off to, def, to uncover exactly which audit strings weren't specifically tested in the qualification test. Um, now that's letting the team go focus in on uh, rerunning tests to either verify that that code is, is, is good or uncovering any problems in that code. So to date we've, we've defined the gaps. Now the team needs to move forward and determine whether there was any code issues or not. And that's, that's one um, one phase of the audit that we're doing, obviously a very important phase, but but certainly by the end of the audit phase across across the test and the code, uh, all of the code will have been um, declared good or fixed through this audit process. It's very robust and methodical. Anybody? Go ahead. Hi, uh, Marina Corn with The Atlantic. Uh, two questions for you. So at this point in the investigation, Your recent conversations, if you had any with the NASA astronauts who were assigned to the first crew mission, how are you reassuring them? 
Yeah, absolutely. So the, the IRT is, is focused on the three. Um, and, and um, you know, another uh, really commend the approach. So what they, they didn't do is give us high-level actions like go fix your code or go identify code issues. They went down and we have 27 priority one, 13 priority two actions where they got you know, very specific about um, the action or the audit that we needed to go do. So we haven't uncovered any other uh, code issues. Um, their approach was to go define exactly what we needed to do to audit and investigate. And the way we're going about that is, is partnering those actions back with them so that we both have good understanding of exactly what we need to go do. Uh, we're actually going to, uh, every step through that audit process, we're going to be collecting the artifacts that either show that the, everything was good or, or the gaps that we might have had. Uh, and so we'll be vaulting those and, and obviously getting back um, with the RT with the customer uh, as we exit the audit process to uh, to allow a review of, of all of those artifacts and products to make sure that everybody understands exactly what we found. So when the audit is over, will you be able to confidently tell us we found X number of issues? Yes. And then about the astronauts? Yes. So astronauts have been incredibly supportive. Um, they, they spend a, a lot of time with our teams um, across the country. Um, and they've expressed high confidence not only in the spacecraft but in our teams. And they've, they've, been, um, they've been out uh, into the factory several times uh, since, since we landed and, and, and brought the spacecraft back. They've, they've looked in the spacecraft. They've actually done uh, some additional testing as, as that team prepares um, for a crewed flight. So been extremely supportive. So let's go to Florida. And I'm going to make an audible here. I know we were scheduled to finish at the top of the hour, which is in just a couple of minutes. Obviously, there are many more questions than we're going to be able to get to. But I'm going to, John's going to hate me for this, but I'm going to take up an extra 15 minutes of your time. Sure. And we'll, we'll run a, a bit over. But let's go to Florida and, uh, for the next question down there. Uh, yeah. With uh, Chris Gellner with NASA Space Flight, um, I, I guess, John, what this is sort of boiling down to me is can, can you walk us through the, the process that was used to decide to not do full simulations and full verifications of the software and the code, why why was it determined that you only had to run, you know, some verification of software logic strings, but not all of them, especially if it could have caught some of these issues, which is what the audit seems to me to be focusing on now. Yeah, I mean, it's... Um you know, first and most important to me is 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 always looking forward. And so, um, you know, working with the IT, working with our team, uh, and defining, uh, making sure we we implement the specific discipline and the specific review process to make sure we get it right. So we, we understand where we were. Uh, more importantly, we understand what we need to do going forward. Uh, and and the team that did that looked at. Um, that made the determination of specifically the tests that we're going to go run. We're looking at at higher complexity. High, what they thought was was higher risk items, and and implemented uh, a qualification test that they thought uh, was was adequate um, and and comprehensive. Um, obviously, hindsight um, uncovered a, a couple of the issues, but. I, I really don't want you or anyone to have the impression that this team um, tried to take shortcuts. They didn't. They, they did an abundance of testing, um, and in certain areas, um, obviously we have, we have gaps to go fill. That is an, but this is an incredibly talented and, and strong team. Um, and the second part of your question, I'm sorry. No, no it was just that one part question. Yeah, so, um, oh, but, you know, one other thing I, I wanted to add, and um, I mentioned it in, in the opening remarks, you know, one of, one of the things that, that we wanted to do, that we committed to do and we are doing, is um, briefing other programs both inside and outside Boeing. And, and, 
and, and even outside Boeing, we've um, as we've discussed this um, this uh, approach to verification wasn't unique to Boeing the Boeing Starliner program. There are programs outside of Boeing that use this basic approach, and and as we have discuss, as discussed with them the issues that we found, um, they're taking the opportunity to drive more discipline uh, into their systems uh, as well. So this this wasn't um, a Boeing or a Starliner unique issue, and so our hope is that we're going to make the entire system. Uh, outside of the Starliner program, more robust going forward. Okay. Who's next here in the room? <coughs> Hi. Uh, Jeff Out Space News. Um, just saw the notice that there's going to be a briefing next Friday about the IRT final results. Maybe you can walk us through what's going to happen between now and next Friday in terms of wrapping up work and what's going to have to take place after that briefing next Friday. Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, I, I think I might be part of that, and so um, I, I, I certainly want to leave a little material for next week. Um, but you know, one of the real focuses uh, that I wanted to get together today um, was was to really to let everybody know first about the mission summary and the data review and the hardware review. Right? That was important to get out. That will not be part of the the IRT briefing. You know, I, I did mention that um, that the IRT is is essentially concluded with the two software issues and they continue to um, investigate um, the, the communication issues. Now, um, in, in the last joint press conference that we had, you know, we all committed to, uh, to getting back together um, to discuss exactly where we were on the IRT at the first week in March. And so even though the IRT is, is not going to be concluded with the, with the comm issues, uh, we wanted to uh, fulfill that commitment and, and give you um, that status at the end of next week on the IRT specifically. So I think that, and I apologize to our friends in Texas, I skipped uh, the Texas office. Did you have a question down there, Steve? Yes, Mark uh, Thank you. You mentioned um, a thruster issue, and I wondered if you could just review again the, the system and uh, the number of thrusters, the phase and flight, and consequence, potential consequence. Oh, absolutely. Um, and first, um, you know, I, I do want to make sure and re repeat myself that the the service module thrusters, uh, well, all of the thrusters, crew module and service module. Okay, so. The, the service module thrusters and the crew module thrusters, but the one you're specifically talking about is service module, those thrusters proved themselves to be incredibly robust. Um, so we, we really had two things um, uh, that happened in flight associated with those thrusters. The first is, you know, after we, we missed um, uh, the first orbital insertion burn and, and, and we end up... Um, after we got the, and, and then we didn't get the forward link established, uh, we needed to raise the orbit to a stable orbit. And so we, we ended up in a very efficient, inefficient, excuse me, a very inefficient three-axis burn to get up to a stable orbit, um, uh, which, because it was a very inefficient burn, um, caused us to use enough propellant that we weren't able to go rendezvous and dock with the space station. Uh, the, through the process of that recovery, uh, to that to that stable orbit, uh, we had a num because and because of the really inefficient burn, we had our the duty cycles uh, on those thrusters were incredibly high, a much higher duty cycle than than you would have nominally, um, and that duty cycle um, is the on-off time. So you have a lot of very short pulses uh, with a very short off time. So you're really you're really uh, pumping those thrusters uh, pretty radically. What happens and we've seen it happen um, on the space shuttle uh, thrusters is in a very high duty cycle you can actually start pumping more heat into the pressure transducer cavity that that heat um, 
on that pressure, the sensing unit on the pressure transducer uh, actually get uh, a heat effect and, and give you an incorrect pressure reading. So you get an offset on that pressure transducer reading. Uh, like I said, we, we'd seen it before we understood it. Um, and so at, at that point, we had a number of thrusters that falsely failed off um, because of the pressure transducer uh, reading feeding back into the software where we have our fault detection um, system. And so at, at that point in the mission, after we got to the stable orbit, we, we took the time. And what we did was we disabled what we call the fitter, the fault detection um, system, for each of those thrusters. And we thrusted each one of them uh, for a very short pulse. Uh, and that allowed, allowed us um, to evaluate whether that thruster was performing nominally. And, and in all cases but one, uh, the thrusters were performing nominally. We kept the, the fault detection override on because of the transducers and, and were able to uh, use those thrusters throughout the remainder of the mission. One of them we, we did not, um, were, were not able to recover. Um, now the design of the system on the service module, there's, um, there's 52 um, total thrusters on the service module, four launch abort engines, uh, 20 um, orbital maneuvering control engines uh, that are for yeah, orbital insertion and for the deorbit burn, and then there's 28 uh, reaction control uh, system thrusters. Those are the ones that we're specifically talking about, and and we're designed. Our, our system design is is very robust. So you've got um, you can you can lose. You've got double redundancy in each axis. So you could lose two thrusters in any one axis and still maintain uh, attitude control of the spacecraft. So there's a lot of redundancy built into the system. So losing one thruster uh, was not uh, not at all an issue for us. Let's uh, try and go to the phones here and try and bring in some folks who have dialed in. Uh, Eric Johnson from Reuters, are you online uh, or on the phone rather? Did you have a question for John? I'll try one more on the phone. Uh, Jackie Waddles from CNN Business. Hey guys, thanks so much for doing this. Um, so I just want to make sure uh, I fully understand too what, what went on with this full, more comprehensive integration testing. Was there was it a concerted decision um, not to run you know the full beginning to end of the, like you mentioned from launch to docking and then again from docking to landing? Was it like a matter of cost that you decided not to run those full tests, or was it just something you didn't realize you needed to do? No, it was definitely not a matter of cost. Um, cost has never um, been a any any way a key factor in any of our decisions on how we need to test and verify our systems. Um, the the team um, thought the time it was more logical to break these mission phases into chunks and do a lot of testing in those smaller chunks. Um, when you do a, uh, a single run from uh, launch to docking, um, you know, that's, that's a 25 plus hour um, single run on the computer. Um, if, we, if we took that beyond the 25 to, uh, um, to a, a day two docking, or even a day three docking, you can understand the, the, the length of that run uh, would be incredibly long. And the, and the team at the time decided that they would rather run you know, multiple tests uh, of different chunks of the mission. Uh, and so from a systems engineering standpoint, you know, we, we did miss um, those two cases. So it was, it was not a matter at all of the team consciously shortcutting or not uh, doing what they believed was appropriate. Um, and so going forward, you know, we're going to continue doing uh, the robust amount of testing in different chunks, but the additional process that we're adding in is to, to do also the, uh, the, dock, the launch to docking and then the docking to, uh, to landing, in addition to what the team has already performed. We have another question here in the room. Should we go to Florida? Different, right? Just, um, just to follow up on your answer there. So you're saying that before you didn't do the full end to end testing, you did it in chunks, but now you are going to do the test 
We will do, yes, going forward, uh, before every flight, we will do um, a launch to docking and a, a docking to landing, in addition to uh, the other tests that we would um, do in, in our qualification testing. And why wasn't that done with this other um, you know, uh, look, Looking back, it's, it's, it's easy to, um, to determine that we should have. Um, I think the sensitivity... Uh, of this mission elapsed time uh, was not recognized by the team and, and wasn't uh, believed to be an important aspect of the mission. So ideally we would have um, run that um, through at least the OI, the, f the first orbital insertion burn. Um, and so from a hindsight standpoint, I think it's, it's very easy to... Um, to see what we should have done because we uncovered an error. Um, at, at the time, that sensitivity wasn't wasn't recognized. Um, it, you know, this is the, the, you know this is a tough business. It's a game of inches, and so you had a highly talented, very dedicated team that um, that, that made that that error. And uh, you know, going forward, we just need to make sure we have the discipline that. Uh, that uh, won't occur again. There you go. Just real quick, in layman's terms, I wonder, could you talk about one of the issues being the jet <coughs> mapping um, software wasn't exactly the same? Mm -hmm. um, in layman's terms, you could explain what, what that means, what jet mapping, exactly what that means. And then also you had said you'd, you'd cut off the test in terms of the integration test with the rocket at separation. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just sort of curious, if you had not done that, would you have caught the problem? Was the problem, it seemed to me the problem was that it wasn't, you were checking, you want to make sure it was mated correctly and communicating correctly, which you said it was, but if it was still passing in the, the wrong information and you had done the full test beyond the separation, wouldn't that still have carried through? We would have caught it. You would have um, caught it. So what... Um, it, yeah, I'm sorry. I need to take better notes. So you're you're going to have to remind me, but oh, I'll, I'll explain. Oh, the jet mapping. Okay, so I'll explain the uh, the second one first. The um, so on the MET time, um, you know, because the launch vehicle essentially owns when it's going to launch, um, and and our our software system feeds off of the launch time, and then and then we'll propagate the burns, the spacecraft burns beyond. So our first orbital insertion burn was going to be X number of minutes and seconds after launch. And and so we pull the MET time from the launch vehicle. Now the, the requirement um, to pull that MET time uh, was, was very specific. Um, the the MET time the the real MET time is not formally loaded uh, onto the launch vehicle until you're in terminal count so very close to when you launch uh, we knew that we understood that um, it's part of our interface um, with ULA and so the requirement for pulling the MET time was very specific it had to be we couldn't pull it until we were in terminal count unfortunately the software was encoded right. And, and as soon as we powered up the launch vehicle and spacecraft 17 hours before launch, um, because the software wasn't coded right and, and it, it, it just pulled the, pulled the MET time immediately upon power up. And so you had a corrupt, I call it uh, MET time, uh, was pulled into our software. Um, and so that, that's how the error was introduced. Um, and, and yes, if, if, uh, we would have run the integrated test uh, with ULA through the first orbital insertion burn um, time frame. We would have seen that we would have missed the orbital insertion burn because the timing was, was, was corrupt. And when we got to that point in time, the, the, the software believed that the burn had happened many hours before, and so it didn't do the burn. So, yes, if we would have ran that integrated test for... Um, you know, a number of minutes longer, it would have uncovered the issue before we flew. Um, you know, getting back to the jet mapping. Well, so did that answer? Yeah. Okay. So then getting back to the jet mapping. Um, so the jet mapping essentially um, 
essentially just takes what thrusters and what valves and turns them into ones and zeros of the software. So it's the decoder ring on what you want to have done to what, uh, how software decodes that into ones and zeros. Uh, because we used the legacy box, it had you know, been used on other programs, it had its own jet mapping uh, built into the propulsion controller. And, and, and because the, that propulsion controller has to perform the separation and deorbit burn itself, um, so it's essentially its own flight computer uh, because you don't have flight computer commanding because we've separated. It, it had that jet mapping already in there from the legacy program. Now when we're integrated with the space with the crew module, the flight computers actually control which, uh, which jets get fired and what valves get operated. And, and so there, because of that we had two different jet maps. And unfortunately, we didn't pick up that second jet map and embed it into um, the software system. So we'll take one more question from Florida, and then I'll give you some instructions as to how we can address uh, any of your unanswered questions to this point. So, uh, Rebecca, do you have a, a final question from the team down there? Hi there. This is Rachel Joy with Florida Today. Um, to sort of go off what Chris was saying, I was wondering about these you know, issues or this legacy hardware. Um, how much of Starliner is made up of legacy hardware, and, and what programs do these pieces of hardware come from? Uh, absolutely. Um, and, you know, before I answer, I, I, you know, I really want everyone to understand the benefit of using legacy hardware where appropriate. Uh, from, a, from a development standpoint, it significantly lowers risk. Uh, from a mission assurance standpoint, it significantly increases mission assurance because you're, we're applicable flying uh, flight-proven hardware. We tried to pull in legacy hardware uh, where we could. I mentioned the propulsion controllers. The, our flight computers that we use, um, uh, previous experience in the uh, X-37B program, the, I mean, I could go on and on. Our, our CIGIs, our inertial nav, Boxes fly on, have flown on multiple different programs, including X-37B. Our parachutes um, go all the way back to uh, the Apollo program. You know, Airborne makes our parachutes, and, and so you've got this legacy trace from, from an Airborne standpoint. Thermal protection on the spacecraft we use, um, very similar um, thermal protection um, that we use on the space shuttle, so we use... Uh, what we call a frizzy, frizzy, and, and even the tiles are uh, our shuttle uh, type of um, thermal insulation. The ablator's not. The ablator on the base heat shield is new, but across all the other thermal protection, it's a legacy space shuttle. Um, I'm just trying to, trying to walk through the systems. I can get a more complete list if you wanted to, but um, it provides us a lot of benefit to pull in legacy hardware and that's kind of at least a short list of, of some of those items. Thank you, John. So uh, for folks who have questions that we have not been able to answer with the limited amount of time we've had of, of John's and we've already taxed him a little bit over time, so thanks for making extra time, John. But um, you would have on the original uh, media invitation to this event, you'd have contact details for Rebecca and Josh, particularly in uh, Florida. Uh, but also myself and Todd and a, a couple of others are also probably named with contact details on that media invitation. If you have additional questions, please just contact one of us. I would suggest that Rebecca and Josh are probably best equipped to be able to respond most rapidly. However, uh, pick anybody on the list and I'm sure we'll do our best to get back to you in, in a very timely fashion. Um, this is obviously just part of our ongoing effort and our recommitment to transparency on the program. I think it's been reflected in the thoroughness of John's uh, answers to your questions. So uh, thank you, John, for make the time. Uh, I'll perhaps I'll hand back to you for any closing remarks and, and we'll wrap up. Now, hey, I just, you know, want to reiterate the commitment to continue working um, with the IRT. We're, um, you know, across this company, we're taking um, a lot of steps to make sure we um, uh, have a full recommitment and, and, and uh, the right process discipline across all of our systems, all of our programs, and, you know, on Starliner in particular, we're um, we, we understand uh, what we need to do to go make this right. We're going to go make it right. Um, and we're going to have a fantastic spacecraft going forward. Um, I'd also like to point out I'm, I'm incredibly proud of the team. They, uh, they responded uh, really well 
um, in spite of the couple of problems we had, it's uh, it's an outstanding team. They responded well before the mission. Uh, they were incredible during the mission, and and they are focused um, on implementing the improvements we need to make going forward. And uh, and last, I, I really want to thank you all for your interest because um, it is it is important to um, uh, to have interest uh, in this in human spaceflight, and so I really do appreciate your involvement. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. For the folks in Houston and uh, Texas, and those of you who have dialed in, please uh, do forward any additional or un unanswered questions, and we'll, we'll uh, quickly respond to those. And thank you for your time and joining us today. Thanks very much.